He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen, and welcome to the digital version of the Sports Creek Church of the Nazarene here on this fourth Sunday in Easter. Yes, this 50-day Easter celebration where we proclaim that the 50 days of Easter is greater than the 40 days of Lent, that the power of forgiveness is greater than the power of sin, and that the power of resurrection is greater than the power of of death. And so we gather on this fourth Sunday in Easter, on this weekly anniversary of the resurrection of the Lord, to lift together our voices in praises and in prayers to the God of life, the God of resurrection, the God of mercy, the God of Easter, and who is revealed perfectly in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And so, welcome to this morning of prayer, to this morning of singing, to this morning of worship. We are so glad that you have come to join us today. And as we get ready to do just that, as we get ready to worship the Lord of Resurrection, I want to make us aware of a couple brief announcements. First, for those of you who are continuing to give to the church, we thank you so much. And we do ask God's blessing upon you as you continue to do so. And those of you who are mailing in your checks, we are getting them. Uh, we, we count them when we count them, I guess is the best way of saying it. But uh, we have counters that have been faithful as coming in and getting uh, all of the, the checks in order and getting them in. And so we do apologize if you have seen any delays in your registers. Uh, but it is happening. And also for those who are giving online, we thank you for that as well. And it is working. I just want to make you aware that if you are giving online, that if you use the bank account number uh, feature, it significantly reduces the fees. Now, if you want to continue using the card number, that's, that's totally fine. But we just want to let you know that the bank account feature significantly reduces the fees. And if you feel like I have just spoken to you in Chinese and you have no idea what I'm saying, just forget all of that. And we'll move on to this next announcement, which, which is this. Uh, we do want to invite you to join us on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our Bible study. We are doing it through Zoom. Pastor Jim has uh, gone out of his way and, and purchased a premium version of Zoom so that uh, we can uh, be together for more than 40 minutes. And so the link is put on our Facebook page every Wednesday to remind us, one, of the meeting, but two, also give us the address for the meeting. We also want to make you aware that if you do not have access to the internet, if you have a phone and uh, call into the church, you can either call the church or my cell number, which is 509-680-3729. You can ask and we can get a hold uh, of the phone number. You can actually call into this Zoom meeting with your phone itself. We won't have your video, but you can hear us and we can hear you for the meeting. So that's another option. You can call in with the phone number if you do not have access um, to the internet with a video camera. So that is happening Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Please do. We encourage you to, to give it a try. Uh, it's been good to be able to see one another and to hear from one another and it's great to be together even if it's in this virtual means. And so that's what we have for way of announcements. Now we have come to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. So as we have been doing, we will. this is a service adapted out of the uh, Book of Common Prayer. It's daily morning prayer, right to, with some tweaks and liberties taken. But the words are going to be up on your screen. And so I will invite you to pray together with me, but also pray together with the church. Use your voice. Read out loud. Sing out loud. Pray out loud as we pray together uh, through this fourth Sunday in Easter. And so... As a church, we proclaim, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our call to worship is Christ our Passover, selections of scripture from 1 Corinthians, Romans, and 1 Corinthians again. 
read responsively with me as I read the regular print, and then you join in with me for the bold print. Alleluia, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. And that is our prayer this morning, that as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And God is faithful, and he will do so. And so I want to invite you this morning to join us, join the church, wherever you are, in singing this great hymn of God's faithfulness. As we sing together, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Hey. 
Our first lesson is from Acts. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. I want to invite us all to read together this uh, very familiar old psalm. It's Psalm 23, and we're going to go out the King James Version because it rolls off the tongue so well and because uh, many of us have it memorized in the King James Version. And instead of doing it responsively, I want to invite us all to pray this psalm together in unison. So please join me as we pray together Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our next lesson is from 1 Peter. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered with you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. I want to invite you now, wherever you are, to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel this morning. This is the holy gospel of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus according to John. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter, by the, enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The gospel of our Lord, praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated at this time.
Well, it's the fourth Sunday of Easter, which means we're still trucking through a little bit. We're a little more than halfway through the Easter season, and the Easter season is 50 days long. And again, as we talked about a little bit earlier, it's 50 days as compared to the 40 days of Lent. And that teaches us the reality of the core of the Christian faith. If there is one doctrine that we have to have and get right, otherwise we just throw the whole rest of the works away. If there's one doctrine at the very core of what it means to be a Christian, it's the, this doctrine right here. It's belief in the resurrection. It's belief that, one, forgiveness, then, is always greater than sin. No matter how great someone may sin against us, Jesus' forgiveness from the cross and his restoration, then, back into his, uh, back into his community after the resurrection confirms that forgiveness for the Christian is always greater than sin. Again, Sin must be fully exposed as it was on the cross in order for healing to happen. That is, according to James chapter 5, we are reminded that healing only comes through true and proper confession of sin. But even so, still, ultimately, the Christian must believe that there is no sin that can withstand the power of forgiveness. And so, we are forgiving people. But also we must believe at the core of our faith that resurrection is always, always, always greater than death. This therefore means that the forces of life are more powerful than the forces of death. Being a people of peace then holds more sway and more influence and more power in the world than being a people of violence. And so... Because we believe in the resurrection, we must believe that forgiveness is greater than sin and that life is greater than death. And in today's gospel, where is again Good Shepherd Sunday, as we saw with the 23rd Psalm and this uh, gospel text about Jesus being the true shepherd, the true gate. In this gospel, we see that as we believe in resurrection, resurrection also tells us that Jesus is greater than all the other rulers of the world. This is uh, critically important for us to remember that all other empires, that all other worldly leaders are simply parodies. They are not the real thing, they are parodies. No matter how powerful they seem, they are parodies of the true kingdom and the true king. And so our challenge then as Christians, the challenge that comes to us from our gospel text today is not to be taken up by thieves and bandits, but to always and only ever follow the good shepherd, the one true king, the one with the power of resurrection, which is greater than the power of death, the one who leads to salvation, the only way to salvation, and that is the way and the king, the person of Jesus Christ. And that means we have to pay attention. We have to be aware that there are counterfeit rulers out there. There are parodies to God's kingship that exist in the world around us, and they're trying to get us to follow them. There are thieves and there are bandits out there. And these are leaders that promise wealth. These are people that promise security. These are leaders that promise freedom. But it's all parodies. They cannot deliver Every politician promises a good economy and promises secure borders and promises freedom to live the American dream. Now, we may disagree vehemently on how to accomplish this task or particularly even what the American dream is. But even so, still, pay attention. Watch any political ad, and they're all going to tell you at least one of these themes in every one of their ads that either this candidate will give you a better economy, more safety, or more liberty, and it's all going to come to those who follow me. But in reality, these parodies of Christ's kingship, all they do is kill and destroy. 
they truly are thieves and bandits. Because even more prevalent in the ads these days are the ads that discredit one another rather than build each other up. In these ads, we see that they are leaders that destroy other leaders. And the even more prevalent reality that we see around us in, in this world built on these empty promises is that there's just simply more war. The truth that we see around us is that the increased wealth in the world, the economies, is only going to a very small percentage of people, and it's happening at the expense of many, many others. These leaders promise wealth, security, and freedom, but they only kill and destroy. These common counterfeits, these thieves and bandits, that still, they still tempt us, though, yet today, to come over close to the fence where they then snatch us up. They always say, come over here to the edges. The grass is greener over here. There's better pasture land. We can, we'll snatch you up over here. But when they do that, when we get close to the fence, they just swipe us up and they use us for their own gain. These bandits, they call us over to the fence, promising greener grass with the promise of a bigger government, right? Now, while Christians very much should petition world rulers to act more equitably and justly towards the poor and the foreigner, regardless of the size of the government, we usually mostly support expansion in government only in military might. But however you support your big government, though, it exposes a common idolatry that's being uh, uh, believed in the church, and that is that the right system of government or the right leaders and the right ideologies are the hope of the world. But they're not. Jesus is the hope of the world. But on the same side of the, uh, on the different side of the very same coin, we have other bandits who are calling Christians over to the fence, promising greener grass and better pastures with calls for smaller government. Now, while Christians should petition world rulers to act more equitably and justly towards the poor and the foreigner, regardless of the government size, we tend to only support cuts in regulations that prevent unfettered disparities of income or health care or cuts in regulations that protect the God-given natural resources around us. But however you support small government, though, it still exposes a common idolatry in believing that the right system of government or the right leaders with the right ideologies are the hope of the world. But they're not. Jesus is. The point, however, is this. Whether you believe in big government or whether you believe in small government, that's not the question that Jesus is going to ask you when you stand before his throne at the resurrection. It doesn't even matter if you believe in the American government or the Canadian or French or South African or Chilean or Japanese or literally any other government in the world. Jesus is going to ask you a simple question. What did you do to the least of these? That's the question. Because the kingdom of God works above all these governments of the world, and it holds judgment against all these governments of the world. Nation states, when they function at their best, simply maintain order and then seek. They don't provide, but they seek justice and equality for all of their constituents. But nation states at their worst become idols, the church, then, should be a prophetic voice reminding the nations that they themselves are under judgment by God for how they perform their duties of maintaining order and seeking justice. That is, do you perform your duties with equity and with grace or by power and might? And we offer this prophetic voice while guarding strictly against falling off the map of idolatry for ourselves. Because these bandits are at the fence and they're calling for you. So don't fall for it. Because the real question is not whether or not you believe in whatever type of authority for the state, but rather if you believe and follow the authority of the good shepherd, the one who is the gate. And again, this isn't necessarily a call for libertarianism either. 
as libertarianism is its own false god. So I don't want anyone hearing this critique and going around saying that pastor is a libertarian. You don't need to know what I am because that's not relevant to the gospel. Rather, I believe that whether the government is big or small, whether the government is run by a monarch, a dictator, or a president, or a congress, or whatever, whether the government is supportive, hostile, or indifferent towards Christianity, it doesn't matter. The church will thrive when our allegiance is given to Christ alone, and the church will flounder when there's even a hint of idolatry among the flock. A donkey or an elephant wearing a sheepskin is still ultimately a wolf wearing a sheepskin. And none, without exception, are really the shepherd or even have the shepherd's interest in mind. I think my thoughts are backed up with evidence as well. In the places where Christians face persecution, the church is growing in leaps and bounds. And this is because there is no question of who you serve when you join a church. You don't take that big of a risk for nothing. You are serving God alone when you join a church in a place of intense persecution. However, in countries where Christians have enjoyed privilege for generations, the church is floundering. It's falling apart at the seams because the lines of devotion are blurred. Who are we really serving? Are we serving Jesus? Or are we serving national interests? But the greater evidence for this is found in Scripture. Israel as a nation state is not the hope of the world, as is clearly shown in 1 Samuel 8. Rather, Israel as the nomadic people of God, as it is established in Genesis 12, and then redeemed in Jesus Christ, that's the hope of the world. And that's why the greater prophetic tradition that is given to us in the Old Testament is not from prophets, who were, who were always patting the Israelite leaders on the back, but it's rather from prophets who were not afraid to speak up and speak out against even the nation of Israel. Because even the kings of Israel are subject to God's judgment. The prophet honored in scripture during the time of David is not one of the court prophets that blindly blesses everything that David does, but rather it's Nathan who is not afraid to call David to task when he sins. And finally, most importantly, as we see Peter preach in Acts 2, verses 29 through 36, David, who is the best king that Israel ever had, he's still dead. He's still in the grave. You can go to his tomb to this day. However, Peter says it is Jesus that God raised from the dead. It's not the conquest of David that brings hope to the world. Rather, it's the self-giving sacrifice of Christ. And so it should be for the church. We live, first and foremost, by the laws of God. We hold loosely to ourselves, and we cling tightly to Christ's resurrection power. In so doing, then, we are free to exercise our prophetic voices against the rulers of the world, whoever they are, especially the rulers who put on sheep's clothing to make us think that they're on our side. Because even more dangerous to the church than persecution is conditional privilege. So we must be a church that recognizes that resurrection alone is the hope of the world. I mean, this text that Jesus gives us, he's pretty, pretty point blank about how narrow that gate is. He says, I'm the gate. Unless you come through me, you ain't getting salvation. It's not happening. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I come to have life, in the, to have life abundantly. But if you do not go through the gate, if you do not go through the gate. So resurrection is our lens for salvation. It only comes through Jesus, not through the nation state, not through any other leader in the world. It comes through Jesus. We read in scripture that Saul killed his thousands and David killed his ten thousands. But it wasn't until the religious and political leaders worked together to kill the son of man that the true purpose of God was revealed to the world. At the cross, we see that love is the supreme power of the world. 
At the empty tomb, we see that the creator of life is more powerful than the forces of death. But you can't spot a counterfeit by devoting your studies to counterfeits. You can only spot counterfeit rulers among us by paying special attention to the lamb, to the true leader. So then, rather than becoming masters in the means of death, let us be a people who study continuously the resurrection of Christ. 1 Peter 2.21 For you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. So what does our example that we should be following look like? Well, Peter continues. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Now, too often, we as Christians fall into the trap of returning abuse with more abuse, with retribution. Or if we start suffering, we respond with threats. So let us discern instead how Jesus interacts with the world so that we may follow in his footsteps. 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins, in his body, on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. On the cross, Jesus turns loose the power of forgiveness in the world around us. And he does it by bearing and forgiving our sins. And in so doing, he then brings us healing. So now, as the people of Christ, we shall bear and forgive the sins of others so that others may be healed in Christ as well. When we drop cable news and conspiracy books and instead become saturated in scripture and in prayer, we start hearing a different voice interpreting the world around us. John 10, 4 through 5. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. As discerning and wise as we may think that we are, the truth is we're all just sheep. We listen and we follow whoever we hear talk the most. So no matter, that happens no matter how wicked who we listen to might be. If we are continually saturated in the voices of whoever, that's the voice we'll begin to follow. So my challenge, and the challenge I believe of the scriptures to us today, is to tune all those voices out and saturate ourselves in the voice of Jesus so that we follow him. Continuously listen to the voice of the shepherd who speaks forgiveness in resurrection and not the bandits who speak division in death. Because we will follow what we hear the most. And so turn off your cable news, stop spreading conspiracy articles, and start bathing in the scriptures and start saying the prayers of the church. Let us be a people that study intently resurrection because we must also be a people who live resurrection acts 2 devotion can happen no matter what government we're under this devotion is a devotion first and foremost to worship as we find in acts 2 verse 42 where they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to the prayers Despite all the fear-mongering that some influencers are trying to spread around us, there is absolutely no evidence that any government is trying to influence our worship. So hop off that train, please, because it only breeds fear. And the perfect love of the Holy Spirit is supposed to drive out fear. But even if this was true, we still don't fear 
because we're going to worship anyways. Even in the midst of this virus, we are still able to be safely together through these means of technology and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we can praise God. We can worship together as a church, even as we are safe from this virus. And so, no matter what, some people may say, there is nothing that can stop our devotion to the worship of God. And then also we see in Acts 2 the devotion to service, as we see in verses 44 through 47. We read these words. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. It's astonishing for me to see the immense good that is still happening in the world around us, especially through the Church of the Nazarene, and therefore also in part through your dollars. As you give, a portion of what you send in goes on and pays missionary salaries and pays for building projects, for the church around the world, and good is happening. And we need to see that even in this midst of the virus, even in the midst of these challenges, the power of resurrection is greater than the power of death because the mission of God continues. And we're going to play a video for you to show you how. Since we're having trouble getting the video up, we're going to pause for just a second here. I'm going to get the volume ready for you. Hold on. Just technical difficulties. Hold on. Hola, mi nombre es Scott Armstrong. Soy de Santo Domingo, República Dominicana, y soy misionero nazareno, ministrando con Génesis. En este tiempo peculiar, la mayoría de nuestros templos están vacíos debido al virus COVID-19. Pero la iglesia sigue hacia adelante. Todavía estamos en misión. Hoy estamos a distancia. Pero de nuestras casas, seguimos orando. Seguimos adorando. Seguimos compartiendo su palabra. Seguimos siendo la iglesia. Todavía estamos en misión. Estamos discipulando a nuevos convertidos por video. We're dreaming and strategizing of how to better reach the city. We're preparing ourselves for revival. God is moving now in the world, in us. En nosotros. En nosotros. Todavía somos iglesia. Los primeros discípulos enfrentaron persecuciones, incluso el martirio. A pesar de todo esto, ellos triunfaron. Ellos cumplieron con su tarea. Y nosotros también cumpliremos con nuestra tarea. Triunfaremos. Romanos 8:37 dice, ¿Podrás separarnos del amor de Jesucristo? Nada ni nadie. Ni los problemas, ni los sufrimientos, ni las dificultades. Tampoco podrán hacerlo el hambre, ni el frío, ni los peligros, ni la muerte. Estamos viviendo un tiempo de victoria y no de derrota. Un tiempo de fe y no de miedo. Así que este es nuestro tiempo, iglesia. En medio de todos nuestros problemas estamos seguros de que Jesucristo, quien nos amó, nos dará la victoria total. Amén. 
Estamos convencidos que Dios está con nosotros. Estamos seguros de que Dios nos protege. Y sabemos que Dios nos ama. Todavía somos la iglesia. Todavía estamos en misión. The mission of the church continues on. The power of resurrection is power, po greater than the power of death. The power of forgiveness is greater than the power of sin. We need to be a church that continues to go forward in the mission of God in all circumstances. And we cannot get distracted from this mission even when we enjoy privilege 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 3 says, Preach the word. Be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, and encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. Another translation says it this way. They will collect prophets who tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. And so we must always, as a church, be mindful whenever an influential preacher calls a worldly leader God's anointed. Jesus alone is God's anointed. These preachers are likely tickling ears in order to remain influential. But Jeremiah, however, shows us in the Old Testament that the best prophets don't get state dinners. They don't get invited to state dinners. Jeremiah, in speaking truth, was thrown in a well. But with that, we cannot get discouraged from this mission either when we suffer persecution. 1 Peter 2, 19 for 20. For it is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. We must always, as a church, stand up for the poor. We must always stand up for protecting the foreigners among us. We must always stand up for protecting God's good creation. We must always stand up for protecting the unborn. We must always stand up for the rejects of society, even if it costs us places of privilege in our political systems. But Jeremiah didn't need to be invited to a state dinner. He, was, he preferred telling the truth from the bottom of a well. Rather, in all things, we must be a people who proclaim that we believe in the resurrection. So whether the skies are sunny or gray, whether we live with privilege or in persecution, whether we're feasting or fasting, whether everything is going great or going poorly, whether the economy is booming or busting, whether we're in the midst of pandemic or good health, let us be a people of resurrection. Let us know that all things, uh, that, I'm sorry, let us know that all things must die. And, let it, and also let us know that death then brings new life. And let us know that in all things, death or life, Christ is king. It is not Moses, David, or Elijah, but rather we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. So now I invite you to stand with me as we confess our devotion to Christ and to the kingdom of God and to the power of resurrection as we confess our faith together as it is found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now at this time, just take a posture of prayer. You can remain standing, you can sit, you can kneel, but take a posture of prayer as we move into the prayers of the church. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Pray responsibly with me these verses. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness, and let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you to, so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but we may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now is the time to move into our intercessory prayer. I'm going to prompt us in a prayer, and then we're going to pause. And in our pause, I'm going to ask you to add your own prayers in response to the prompt. At the end of the pause, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, to which we can all respond together, hear our prayer. And so, let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, we pray for your church at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. So at this time, we pray for our public servants. We pray for uh, also those who are part of the critical infrastructure and for our elected officials. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you to give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. And so now we pray for industry, that it may be a responsible industry. We pray now also for our farmers as we are in this planting season. And we pray for the earth, that we may love it rightly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. And you call us, church, to pray for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. And we especially ask you, 
church to pray for those who are suffering sickness at this time, whether it's from the COVID-19 or whether it's from other sicknesses that are being delayed or postponed because of COVID-19. We ask that you pray for all those who are sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. And we pray, especially those who have lost loved ones during this time, that your, that your hand of mercy and love and grace will wrap us up, Lord, and that we can, that we can commit those who have gone on to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, I lift up with special thanksgiving just the generosity of this church, the, the, those tuning in uh, 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 with dedication, those who are joining us on Wednesday nights, those who are committing us to prayer. Lord, I am again just so thankful for all the, all the notes and reminders that, that, Lord, that so many people are praying for me and my family and for this church. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. And, Lord, I lift up this church, that your hand of blessing may be upon us. Lord, that you will continue to guide us through this season. Lord, that you, that, that you would guide us into the wonderful future that you have in store for us, Lord, and that we may truly be a people of resurrection. And, Lord, for those of us who are suffering at this time, I ask your special blessing upon us, O oh God that we may know in all certainty that we are not alone when we are alone with you. And Lord, we testify that at all times you are with us. So Lord, help us to be a people who live your grace, who live your mercy, who live your forgiveness, who live by your resurrection. And we give all thanks and honor and glory to you, O God, as we pray all these things in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, and our Lord. Amen. And Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common prayer to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, that you will be in the midst of them. So fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And with that, until we meet again, I ask that you live and grow and go in God's peace. Blessings on you this day. Amen. <laughs>